So welcome everybody um, for uh, today's TCS Plus talk by uh, Mohsen Gaffari. Um, before we start, let me first uh, thank the operator with me, uh, Clement Canon, who's here. And also behind the scenes, uh, uh, G. Kamat, Thomas Vidik, Ilya Rosenstein, and uh, Anindya De. Um, let me also remind you that in two weeks we'll have the probably the last uh, TCS pass of the spring. Uh, it will be uh, by Eric uh, Weingarten. Uh, so, yeah, today's speaker is... Um, oh, actually, should we go around the table? Should we do this tradition again? Let's uh, quickly see who is here with us today. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, with us, we've got uh, Andrew Clark uh, from the University of Colorado, Boulder. Uh, we've got... Uh, Janish Mehta from Caltech. Uh, we've got uh, K. Gobalash Krishnan from uh, East Carolina University. Uh, you've got Shravas Rao from NYU. Uh, we've got Sina Shehan from the University of Michigan. And uh, Sarasha Yinshaw, sorry, I'm gonna mess with your name, uh, Sarasha from uh, Michigan State University. Okay, thanks, um, Clement. For some reason, I couldn't see the audience, uh, so I hope everything is fine. Did you do present them all? Uh, not, not for okay. all. <laughs> okay, so if it continues like that, you might have to give the talk. If I can't even see most of them, but let's see. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, uh, today's speaker is uh, Mohsen, Mohsen Gaffari. He's uh, currently a professor at uh, ETH uh, Zurich, uh, and he graduated from uh, MIT uh, last, last year. Um, he's an expert in distributed computing, uh, more specifically uh, distributed graph algorithms uh, and network algorithms. So without further ado, let's uh, start today's talk. So, Mohsen, thank you. Uh, thank you, Odette. Uh, can everyone hear me or can I assume safely that everyone hears me? Yes, okay. good. All right. So, today's talk will be about local distributed graph algorithms or local distributed graph problems and the complexity of them. And this is based on a joint work with Fabian Kuhn and Yannick Maus, both at University of Freiburg. All right, so let's see what's the setting. So the setting is this classical model from, from the 80s, actually, first introduced by Nati Lineal, or maybe first formalized by Nati Lineal, which works as follows. And it's, it's mainly motivated by computer networks. So we'll assume that we have a simple graph, simple, undirected, unweighted graph with n vertices. And we'll use delta to denote the maximum degree of this graph. We'll have one computer on each of the nodes of the graph. So this is like a computer network. So we have computers on each of the nodes of the graph. And these computers, well, they can compute. And they can also communicate. And the communication happens in synchronous message passing rounds, round one, round two, round three, and so on. In each of these rounds, each of the computers can send the message to each of its neighbors. Okay, so at the same time, you can send the message to all of your neighbors. And generally, the model doesn't restrict the message sizes, nor the computational power of the, these computers. Okay, so you can send essentially everything that you know up to that point to your neighbors. And also you can compute whatever that is possible given the information. So it's really a matter of sort of receiving the right information. Or, okay, so this is the, the setting. And what do we mean by graph problems? Well, pick any of your favorite graph problems. Uh, the, the way that it gets sort of phrased in this setting is that at the beginning, the computers do not know anything about the topology of the graph. So essentially, they wake up to the system. Uh, at the end, each of the computers should know its own part of the output. Okay? So for instance, if you're computing a coloring, each of the computers should know its own color and the coloring of the graph. Okay? So, and to, to compute this coloring, well, we go in rounds of talking to your neighbors and getting to a coloring. And well, the time complexity measure in this model is just how many rounds does it take to, to compute the output so that everyone knows his or her own output. 
So time complexity is just a number of rounds. And I guess you can already see why it's called the local model, because whatever that the node does will be actually a function of the, the local information available to the node. In one round, all that they can learn is what's available to my one-hop neighborhood. In two rounds, all that they can learn is what's available to my two-hop neighborhood, and so on. Okay. So, so the area has been studied since the 80s. There's a long line of research. Today, I'll be focusing on four of the problems which are sort of central in this area or classic in this area. So these problems are maximal independent set, maximal matching, a delta plus one vertex coloring, and two delta minus one edge coloring. A, let me emphasize that I'm talking about maximal and not maximal. So I just mean an independent set to which you cannot add any vertex. And similarly for uh, vertex colorings, delta denotes the maximum degree. So any graph has a delta plus one vertex coloring, and any graph has a two delta minus one edge coloring. In fact, all of these structures in the sequential world, these are trivialities. And we, we just go through the vertices of the graph, for instance, in the case of maximum independent set or vertex coloring. We just go through the vertices and decide about each of the vertices in a greedy fashion one by one. Right? So in the sequential world, these are trivialities. But in the distributed systems, they are not so trivial. In fact, many of the problems remain open. And they are also very important. I will cover some of the, the results that are known about these. Let me say that these, these problems are not completely unrelated to each other. In fact, there are a lot of relations between these problems. And this graph, the sort of the, the, the picture of these four diagrams shows the relations that we know about these problems to each other. To each other. For instance, maximal matching is simply a special case of maximal independent set, just because, well, maximal independent set of the line graph is a maximal matching. Similarly, between edge coloring and vertex coloring, if you just take the line graph, it becomes a vertex coloring. Right? There's a little bit of a more interesting relation between vertex coloring and maximal independent set. So if someone gives me a graph and wants to compute the delta plus one vertex coloring of it, and I know how to solve maximal independence set in a distributed fashion, I can simply sort of take the Cartesian product of the graph on which I want to compute the coloring with a clique of size delta plus one. This is a good exercise. If you spend a few minutes on it, you will realize uh, the connection. If, if you just compute the maximal independence set on this blown up graph, it will give you a coloring of the, of the original graph. Okay, so there are relations between these problems. Uh, so let's see what's the state of the art about these classic problems. So here is the place that we see a sort of two very opposite worlds uh, about what's, what's known about these problems. So we have very simple log n round randomized algorithms for these problems. Okay. In fact, we have had this since 86. Okay. Uh, nowadays, we have even some better algorithms, like little o of log n. I will, I will go through this a bit more carefully. So, so in the randomized side, we have very simple algorithms and also very efficient okay, log n rounds. On the other hand, for deterministic side, we do not have even poly log n algorithms. Okay, we do not have poly log n round deterministic algorithms. Typically, the best that we know is this function 2 to the square root of log n which is, well, below polynomials, but above any polylog n. And in fact, this is, this is one of the, this is perhaps the most well-known open problem of the area. It was already stated in Lineal's 87 paper, which can we get a polylogarithmic deterministic algorithm for MIS, which would also answer the problem for the others. Uh, after Lineal's work, people also started saying, OK, if we can't get it for MIS, can we get it for the other ones? Can we get it for these that look possibly simpler? Can we get it for delta plus one vertex coloring and maybe two delta minus one edge coloring and so on? In fact, if you look at the, the books on this area, for instance, if you pick the distributed graph coloring book by Baron Boyman Elkin, this is a book from 2013, the first five open problems are all related to solving these problems, okay, getting polylog n time deterministic algorithms for these problems. Okay, let's take a look at, let's take a look at, well, sort of, for instance, the MIS problem a bit closer. Uh, 
So this is one of the places that we can actually give lower bounds based on this locality barrier, because in T rounds, all that you can learn is actually just within your T hop neighborhood. Okay, so there's a lower bound, roughly speaking, log delta rounds is necessary for solving MIS. The lower bounds, unfortunately, like the, the proof doesn't go through, you have to cap it. Uh, sort of, well, once delta becomes too large, the, the, the lower bound doesn't work. So the lower bound is actually a minimum of roughly log delta and square root of log n. Okay. Uh, on the algorithmic side, there have been a number of results. Well, in 84, there was, a, there was an algorithm. In fact, in fact, actually, it was phrased in the PRAM model, but it immediately gives also a log to the 4 algorithm for MIS. There was a paper about a year after an order of log n time algorithm, randomized MIS algorithm. Many of you might have seen this algorithm in your randomized algorithms classes. This is sort of a, one of the things that has attracted a lot of attention to the area. It's actually, a, it's actually one of the papers that has received this Dijkstra award. But the algorithm is truly simple. So this is actually the whole algorithm, okay? these two lines or three lines. So the algorithm goes in iterations. Uh, in each of the iterations, each of the nodes in the graph picks a random number, let's say between 0 and 1, and let's say real number. Actually, it doesn't matter that it's real number, but let's just say it's real number. Okay, so each node has its own random real number. Now, the, the local minimas will join the MIS, okay? And then they get removed from the graph because their problem is solved. And since these guys join the MIS, well, they get removed from the graph, but also their neighbors get removed from the graph because their neighbors cannot join anymore. So that's one iteration. So we remove these. Next round, next iteration, we again new random numbers and so on. I mean, the, the, the first process of generating these random numbers, you might also recall it as the, the Hungarian method of generating an independent set. Turon's proof of the existence of large independent sets essentially is doing the same thing. Uh, okay, so it's a very simple process which proves, uh, which within log n time, uh, with high probability, computes an independent set. Okay. I should say that the, the algorithm is simple. The analysis, there are ways of doing it in a very simple manner, but it takes a bit of, a, sort of thinking, but it's a good exercise. All right, so that's sort of what we knew even in the 80s about MIS. Uh, there's a little bit better algorithm. We know that sort of we can solve it in roughly log of maximum degree, plus this smaller term, or this, this term that is usually smaller, 2 to the square root of log log n. I will come back to this term and I'll talk about it a bit more. So this is the picture on the randomized side. On the deterministic side, the best that we know is 2 to the square root of log n. Okay. And this has remained there since, let's say, 92. So we don't have any poly log n time algorithm. A similar picture is there about delta plus 1 vertex coloring. Okay. So Lineal in his early paper showed that even on a ring graph, on a very simple graph, just a simple cycle, it takes log star of n rounds to compute a delta plus one coloring of it, the three coloring of the of the graph of this ring. Okay. Uh, if you haven't seen this proof, it's a very nice proof. There are many simpler ways of it, but it's actually it, it, it's it, one can say that it's a, a sort of a Ramsey theory type of a proof. I mean, or there are actually written versions of it which sort of phrase it in that language, but there are also more direct ways of reading it. They look a bit more ad hoc, but probably they are easier to read. Uh, the, the, the randomized algorithm side, well, the log n was there from a long time ago. Here, there is actually a square root of log delta algorithm. That's actually a result from last year by Harris, Schneider, and Sue. Uh, on the other hand, the deterministic side, it again remains at this 2 to the square root of log n. This is the best that we know. Okay. So essentially, what I want sort of you to remember is morally this picture, which there's a, there's a very different uh, set of bounds on the deterministic side and on the randomized side, okay? So randomized side, it's at most log n, but actually things that are a bit better, and deterministic side, it's usually it's 2 to the square root of log n, except for one special case, this maximal matching thing, which there was a breakthrough in 98 and 99, which gives a polylog algorithm for maximal matching for, for reasons that maximal matching has some nice properties. Towards the end, I will get to it. 
Maximum matching allows us to solve it in polylog n time, whereas the other ones didn't have this property. OK, so if you look at the randomized site, you see this behavior on the bounds, which there is a term that depends on delta. Right? On the independence that I'm matching, it's log of delta. And on the colorings, it's square root of log of delta. Okay. So typically, the randomized algorithms, what they do is they go for this number of rounds in a random fashion. At the end, what remains of the graph are many connected components, but each of the connected components is roughly polylogarithmic size. Okay. So this is what we call graph shattering. So the graph is broken into very small components, polylog size components. And then you essentially resort back to the deterministic algorithms that we have to solve each of these connected components. Okay, so if you look at these, the bounds that depend on n, you see how I mean they are essentially replacing n by a log n or by a polylog n if it's okay. So this this started to seem like okay, if we want to solve randomized algorithms faster or randomized if we want faster randomized algorithms. We should probably also spend time on improving the deterministic algorithms. But actually, there was a nice, there, there was a very nice result from Nasty, which said that it's not only for that method, but this is a complete connection in the following sense. If you somehow by mistake manage to improve the randomized algorithms, like improve the, the, the dependency on M in the randomized algorithms, in fact, one can extract out of those faster deterministic algorithms. Okay. Uh, more formally, the, the result says that the randomized complexity on n vertex graphs is at least the deterministic complexity on square root of log n vertex graphs. Okay. I will not go into the proof of this. Uh, it's not that long of a proof. Uh, in fact, I would suggest you think about it as an exercise and then probably Looking at the paper, it's a very nice real. It's a very nice relation between the randomized side and the deterministic side. In fact, this is also a good justification for why we should care about deterministic complexity. Right. So I mean, before this, one can say that well, for complexity theoretic reasons, is randomness necessary or not? Those are good reasons to think about deterministic algorithms. But this is also a more concrete reason that even if you just care about randomized algorithms. There's a good reason that you should care about deterministic algorithms. In fact, seeing this paper was the time that I started switching to the deterministic algorithm side. Before this, I, I felt that, well, why do I care, really? So this result was one of the things that I started thinking that, OK, time to switch to the deterministic algorithms. All right, so I should say a side comment. Uh, these bounds that I was showing on the deterministic side, they are about worst case. If you focus on graphs that have small maximum degree delta, then there is a very different line of work that tries to get faster and faster algorithms, typically as a function of this maximum degree, a polynomial dependency on the maximum degree. And this, this dependency started with, a, for instance, for delta plus one vertex coloring, it started with delta squared. It gradually has been improved to roughly linear, and then now it's, it's roughly in square root of delta. Hopefully, it will continue to improve. But it's a, it's a very different side of the, of the story. Okay, so I will not go into that part of the picture. Our goal is to get, the, the, the ideal goal is to get polylogarithmic bounds. And in fact, the area thinks of polylogarithmic bounds as efficient algorithms. Uh, sort of, if I want to translate, we think of polylogs as the, the polynomials of the centralized world. So polylogs are what we call efficient, and things above polylogs are not efficient. Okay, so, so this is the, the, the state of the art about the, the problems. Uh, I thought there was a question, yes. Yeah, I've got a question. I probably have missed it, but the lower bounds are there for randomized, deterministic, or? Uh, so the two lower bounds that I mentioned, uh, this one yeah. and this one, both are for randomized algorithms, too. Okay. Okay, in the case of, uh, in this case, the lower bound directly applies for both. In the other case, one has to do a bit more work. And actually, in that case, I should actually cite a paper by Naor, which would give the, the lower bound uh, for the randomized site and not linear version. All right, so let's go back to. All right, so we have seen what's the state of the art, at least for these problems. Let me say. Sort of what are the typical challenges in this local model? And here I'm going to be a bit, 
a bit more hand wavy rather than formal because I'm trying to say what are the, the challenges. Uh, not really a formal thing. So one challenge obviously is the locality of this model in the sense that in our rounds, what a node V learns is only the information that was available within its R hop neighborhood, right? In the first round, node V only learns its own one hop neighborhood topology. In two rounds, you get your two hop neighborhood and so on. So in our rounds, essentially you're learning only your R hop topology. And an R round algorithm is really a function mapping your R hop topology to the output. So that's really the, the reason that the, the model is called local model and why it's the study of locality and why there's a locality challenge. But there's actually also a different challenge to the model, which is this thing that's perhaps one can call it a local coordination or, or symmetry breaking. For instance, if you think about the coloring problem, we are really asking nodes to, to sort of pick different outputs, I mean, nearby nodes, which possibly have symmetric viewpoints of the world or mostly symmetric viewpoints of the world to pick different colors. Right? And, and the problem is that in the distributed model, these nodes need to decide in parallel. Right? They, they all need to decide essentially at the same time what's their color. So this takes a bit of a, let's say one can call it coordination between the nodes or a symmetry breaking. And this is actually a place that it's very natural that randomization helps with this part. For instance, if you think about coloring, right, if you think about coloring the vertices, if nodes pick random colors and then they keep the color if none of the neighbors picked, this already is a, is a good way of sort of breaking the symmetry or having a local coordination on who picks which color. Right? And in fact, there's a very simple delta plus one vertex coloring, which again works in log n time. The, the idea is very simple. So you go in iterations, in each iteration, you pick one of the colors, a random one of the colors that is not picked by your neighbors before in the previous iterations. And then, well, everyone is doing this at the same time. At the end, you keep that color if none of your neighbors picked it in that round. Okay. And then if, if you didn't succeed, well, you forget that and you move to the next round. Uh, one can again prove that after log n iterations of this, uh, you get a delta plus one coloring of the whole graph. Everyone is done. Okay, so, so this is this, this symmetry breaking and local coordination challenges is a place that randomization seems to be natural to help. Okay. So, well, to try to understand these two challenges, we try to essentially decouple these two aspects from each other, which led us to, to uh, sort of defining a sequential variant of the local model. Okay. So perhaps the, the, the model on its own is not that important, but it's a very good tool for studying the challenges and sort of separating things from each other. So now I will be defining a sequential variant of the local model. So what is the model? Well, instead of having all the nodes decide at the same time, I want to allow them to, to process things sequentially, but still preserve this locality aspect of the problem. Okay. So what I'll do is the following. I'll have some locality parameter R, or maybe R of N, it's a function of N. And then I will also have a arbitrary order of the vertices, V1 to Vn. And I will process the vertices one by one according to this order. So maybe I pick the first vertex, that vertex reads its own Rn hop neighborhood. As a function of that, it determines what's the output. Okay. And maybe it also remembers this output. Okay. So the node also remembers what it, its output was, or maybe if it even remembers everything that it has read up to that point. Okay. Then I go to the second node in the order. Again, this node reads its own Rn hop neighborhood, computes the output. Third node, same story, fourth node. So I, I want to emphasize here that when, when the node reads its own Rn hop neighborhood, it sees what the, the previous nodes in the process have done or have read. So I, I don't want to sort of limit the memory of the nodes. I want sort of, I'm, I'm allowing the model to be as powerful as possible. As you will see, 
a stronger model just makes our results stronger also. Okay? So, so the node is allowed to see everything that was done by the previous nodes in its own bulk, in its own RN Hopman group. Okay, so this is the sequential variant of the model. And so we just process the vertices one by one and so on. Okay, so I want to say that the model is actually very powerful. Well, one easy way of it is that these problems, delta plus one vertex coloring and MIS and so on, they become essentially trivialities in this model. So for instance, MIS, let's, let's think about MIS, right? So I want to say that MIS in this sequential local model we can solve it with locality one. Why? Let's just think about this order that is given to us. Uh, what I will have is that each of the nodes, when it's the turn of this node, it will check its neighbors. If none of them is already in the MIS, this node will join the MIS. If some of them, or maybe one of them is in the MIS, then this node will not join the MIS. Okay? So essentially just reading your neighbors suffices to, to determine whether you belong to MIS or not. Similar story for delta plus one coloring. If you just read the colors currently given to your neighbors, you can decide about your own color. Right? So this is just the, just the basic sequential greedy type of way of solving this problem. Right? In, in a sense, you can think about the sequential local model, what I, I will denote as local from now on, is, is in a sense generalizing this, this greedy idea overall. These, these greedy ideas that just look at something around the node and decide about the fate of that node. Okay, so, well, most importantly, all of the classic problems, you know, at least those four that we talked about, belong to S local with locality just one. Okay, so, uh, okay. a question? Yes. Yeah, so, just to make sure, um, you're saying there's no communication anymore. Um, there's no communication, exactly. This is just a sort of a sequential process. I mean, there's not even notes. We can think about, I mean, you can think about it as a single computer solving the whole thing now, but it's only allowed each time to read only that area. What is it exactly that you're reading? You're reading kind of the topology, the neighborhood. You're reading the topology and perhaps what those neighbors computed before. The output, output of the The output computer. for, in fact, I mean, I, I will allow them to remember everything that they read up to that point. No, like, remember everything. Let's allow all the nodes to remember everything that they did up to that point. So what, I'm trying to understand what everything is. So it's basically the neighborhood well, of they the read the topology, right? They, they read what their neighbors or their neighbors that's have right. done up to that point. Right? So like the last guy might be able to see the whole graph or it, it, it might be able to see the whole graph, potentially. I should emphasize that, uh, perhaps actually it's very related to this point. So the algorithm or an S-local algorithm should work for an arbitrary order of the vertices and not for just one order of the vertices. Notice that, for instance, for MIS, this works for arbitrary order of the vertices. For delta plus one coloring, it's, it works for arbitrary order of the vertices. And this is important to the, to, the, to the discussions that I will have from now on, okay? So we want the model as strong as possible, except for this restriction, that the algorithm should work for any arbitrary ordering. Good. All right, so let's proceed. So, Okay, let's let's define some complexity classes about this about the the local model and the S local model. So uh, I will use local of T of n to to be problems that I can solve in T of n rounds deterministically in the local model. Uh, similarly, S local of T of n is those that I can solve in sort of locality T of n in the S local model deterministically. Okay, so for instance, MIS and delta plus one coloring they belong to S local of just one. Okay, good. So uh, like this is a notation that's more or less the rest of the talk will be using this frequently. So if something is unclear at this point, this would be a good point to, to pause and maybe spend more time. Okay, good. So, well, I'll also use some shorthand. P local will be those that I can solve efficiently in the local model deterministically. So like those that I can solve poly log n time. PS local are those that in the S local model I can solve with locality poly log n. Okay. So just to remember now, PS local, you can think about it as capturing all of the classic problems that we talked about, for instance, those four problems, and in fact, far beyond that, right? So it's a generalization of PS local is a generalization that 
includes all the all the classic problems of the area. Okay, and of course we can also define the randomized variants of this: the R local, R S local, P R local, and P R S local. I, I imagine that you you guess what the definitions would be. All right, so some definitions of complexity classes. Well, what are the relations between these complexity classes? That's the that's the thing that we want to understand. Okay, so there is some trivial relation between these things, things that you can solve with sort of in, in TN rounds in the local model. You can definitely do the same thing in the S local model. Just simulate the local model algorithm for it or simulate the distributed algorithm for it. So, so P local is definitely a subset of PS local. This is, this is a very basic relation. There are things that are a bit more interesting. Turns out that this very powerful looking model, PS local, is actually sort of not that powerful, maybe. Okay. So if you give me randomization in the local model, I can actually run the same PS local problems. Okay. So really, sort of it's perhaps if this is a justification of sort of this S local model. It says that PS local is a part of sort of randomized algorithms uh, in the local model, okay? Uh, and actually, there's another relation, which is problems that are in PS local, we can solve them in the local model with locality 2 to the square root of log n. This is this familiar, or hopefully by now familiar term, 2 to the square root of log n, which keeps popping out more or less frequently. Uh, so the, the proofs of these two facts, I will talk about them in the next slides. They are mostly by network decompositions. Okay, this this concept of network decompositions. But now a rephrasing of this this classic problem is, or perhaps a generalization of the the classic open problem is that is is p local equal to p s local? Okay, we know that there is. Well, p local is a subset of p s local, and in fact, p s local is a subset of the randomized ones in the local side. Is it actually also equal to p local? Okay, so that's sort of just perhaps another way of putting the classic open problem. All right, so let's talk about these two facts, the the ones indicated in green, um, because that's also a good way of sort of going forward with the problem. Uh, so we will be using this. Uh, old concept of network decompositions. And this was first introduced in 89 by our book, Goldberg, Luby, and Plotkin. Uh, and actually, variants of this appear later on in under many different names. Maybe in the next slide, I will point out to somehow this, this concept has sort of appeared in many places, but the, the, the connections in the, in the literature are somewhat lost. Okay. So, Okay, the basic definition for a DNCN network decomposition is that you will decompose the vertices into clusters. What you want that is that each of the clusters has a small diameter, okay, at most d of n, it's a function of n. And you also want the coloring of these clusters, well, so that the adjacent clusters are not colored with the same color as usual. And you want the coloring to have also a small number of colors, C of n colors. Okay, so two properties to keep in mind. The, the clusters have small diameter, and the clusters are colored with a small number of colors, Cn and Dn. Okay. So think about Cn and Dn as small values, for instance, log n. Okay. And we'll actually get back to that. For now, let's, let's think about this as an abstract function. So, uh, well, it's not hard to see why the CNDN network decomposition would actually help us solve the classic problems. Let's, let's look at, for instance, the case of, say, MIS or delta plus one coloring. Let's say somebody gives me a DNCN network decomposition. I claim that then I would be able to solve the let's say, for instance, MIS, in just CN times DN rounds. Why? Well, I will be going through the colors one by one, colors of the clusters. Okay, so let's think about the first color. Now I'm looking at the clusters of the first color. Okay. Each of these things is a cluster of diameter DN. 
and they are sort of far away from each other. They are not adjacent. So they can essentially solve their own problems independently. And each of these clusters is low diameter. So effectively, what you can even do is that have one node in the cluster, learn the whole topology of the, the cluster, solve the problem locally, give it back to the nodes. Right? This just takes about the n rounds, because the diameter is very small. Right? The diameter is just the n. Okay? So the first color, you can solve it in the n time. You go to the second color, similar story, except that you have to remember that when you're solving, for instance, the second color, besides learning the topology, you also want to learn the, the boundary conditions. So, I mean, the things that are decided on the boundary of this cluster. For instance, the colors of the, the, the nodes of the other the previously processed clusters, you want to also learn those colors. And when you gather this in the single node, that will allow you to, to decide the delta plus one coloring for vertices of this cluster and so on. So essentially, delta plus one coloring or MIS, either of these problems you can solve with in CN times DN. Actually, this is, well, this is not really specific to delta plus one coloring. It's, it's more or less any S local problem, any, anything that has a good S local algorithm, you can do something very similar. So now you would be, suppose that I have an S local algorithm with locality R of n. What I would do is I would ask for a DNCN decomposition of G to the 2 R of n. So the, the, the reason that I'm going to G to the 2 R of n is that now the clusters would be more than, more than 2 R of n apart. Okay? So they are sort of able to be processed independently. Okay. And I will be thinking about essentially doing what we had above with the same algorithm here. First, process the, the nodes of the clusters of color one. Right? You can process all of them at the same time. For the sequential algorithm, you can tell the algorithm that, oh, I process this cluster first, then this other cluster, and so on. Since these, these clusters are far away from each other, they are more than two RN hops apart. What happens in this cluster should not impact what happens in the other cluster, and so on. Okay. So you process the first color of the clusters, you, you proceed to the second color, and so on. So essentially, network decomposition would allow us to transform sequential local algorithms to algorithms in the local model with some overhead. The overhead is this Rn times Cn times Dn. Okay. So for, for those that have efficient as local uh, algorithms, this Rn would be polylog. Okay. So that term is not that important. Now it's the question of the Cn times Dn. What is that? And also, how long does it take to compute the Cn sort of this DNCN decomposition. Right? So these are the two aspects that we need to pay attention. How hard is it to compute this decomposition? And what are the parameters C and the end of it? Okay. So, well, here's, a, here's one result. Any graph has a log n log n decomposition. And this is not too hard to see. This first appeared in the sparse partitions paper of our book and Pelek. It was actually implicit there, but it was made explicit by, in, a, in a paper by Lane, and Sachs. Any graph has a decomposition into clusters with log n colors, such that the clusters have diameter at most log n. Uh, the way of computing this, possibly you have seen it under the name, I don't know, like, ball carving, uh, padded decomposition, CKR, so on and so forth. This disappears under a lot of names. Uh, the idea is that, for instance, if you want to compute the clusters of the first color, let's say you start from one node. You grow the ball so long as the ball is growing by more than a two-factor. Every hop that the ball is growing by more than a two-factor, you grow it. This cannot continue too many times. It cannot continue more than log n times. So at some point that the growth slows down, you chop it. That becomes one cluster, you put it aside, and you take out the, the boundary and deactivate it so that the, the components are not. That's the first ball. You continue this thing. These will give you the, the first color of the clusters. And then those boundaries that you had thrown away, you bring them back, you repeat the process. This would be a log-in, log-in decomposition. Okay. So I'm, I'm going over this a bit fast. Potentially, many of you have seen this idea or things close to it. Anyways, that's the existential aspect. And actually, what I described to you is, is already an algorithm in the sequential local model. 
It just is directly some, something that looks only at log squared neighborhood. So nothing, nothing fancy. So this decomposition already belongs to a local model deterministically in log squared locality. So the question is, what is the complexity of this decomposition in local model and in, in the randomized variant of the local model? Okay, so there is a there's a paper from, well, this, this, this paper that I keep citing from 92 by Panconesi and Srinivasan. If you take their algorithm and put it together with some ideas of another paper by our Bookberger and Cohen and Pellick, you actually get that sort of this, this, uh, this network decomposition. You can compute it in two to the square root of log n rounds uh, deterministically. Okay. So this is, this is what leads to the fact number two that. Any sequence, any polylogarithmic time sequential local algorithm can be transformed into a local algorithm with complexity two to the square root of log n. Uh, on the randomized side, there's a very elegant algorithm by Lineal and Sachs. It's again one of those two liner or three liner algorithms. Okay, I won't cover it here, which solves the problem in log square terms. So it gives a network decomposition with complexity log squared. And this is sort of the reason behind the, the fact number two. So anything that you can solve in the sequential model uh, in polylogarithmic time, you can actually solve it in the randomized side of the local model with polylogarithmic time complexity. Okay, so this is the connections between these facts. So just to recap, we have these two relations. Okay. So in light of these facts, which are, well, I mean, these are, these are essentially follow-ups from the from the prior work, just, just putting together. Uh, we can ask, well, what are the open problems now? Well, clearly, the main open problem is this PS local versus P local. Are they equal or not? So far, we haven't done anything about this. We have just essentially sort of found a diff perhaps a different way of looking at the problem. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, we don't have anything beyond this. Okay, we don't have any answer for this problem. Uh, but we can start thinking about, well, can we say something meaningful about this problem? Okay. In particular, uh, can we come up with complete problems in this S-local site, which are very simple, and if we solve those problems, we would get sort of this, this equality. Right? Or in a sense, um, I'm asking, like, are there complete problems in this PS-local? I will formalize this completeness in a second. Okay. And I'm just saying that problems that if you solve them in the local model in poly log n locality, they would imply that PS local is equal to P, P local. So we have seen that this network decomposition is a complete problem in this sense. If we get network decompositions in poly log n time, in poly log n raw complexity, that would imply uh, equality between these two things. But network decomposition is a, I mean, it, it's this object, maybe it's not as basic as one might hope. So we would hope that we find more basic problems which capture the, the power of randomization. Okay, so this is this is what I'll be talking about in the rest of the talk. This this S local completeness. Just to just to repeat that part, I, I don't want to sort of go into complexity theoretic definitions of reductions and so on. What I really want to say is that if you solve this problem in polylog n locality, it would imply that the other problem is also solvable in polylog n locality. So that's that's what I'm referring to as a Reduction. If you want formal definitions and sort of what exact this, what, what exactly is the connection between these things, perhaps it's better to look at the paper. Okay, so this is the, the relation. So there are uh, the paper presents a number of problems that turn out to be complete. Okay. I want to tell you about just one of them, which I feel that actually it captures the essence of what we don't know about the power of randomization in this in this model. And the problem. This, this one problem is perhaps it might look a bit made up, but in a few minutes it might start looking a bit more natural. Okay, so we'll have this a bipartite graph, an arbitrary bipartite graph is given to us. What we want to do is we want to color the, the vertices on the right side of this bipartite graph by just two colors, red or blue. Okay. And what we want from this coloring is that from the viewpoint of each of the vertices on the left side, he sees about a fair split of this neighborhood. Okay, so for instance, if I'm looking at this vertex V, and if the degree of V is large, if the degree is smaller than, for instance, log N, 
I, I let that node go for free. Okay. So if the degree of vertex V is at least log n, what I want from sort of the, the coloring of the, the R side is that about half of the neighbors of V are red and about half of them are blue. Or more formally, I want at least the lambda fraction of the neighbors to be red and at least the lambda fraction to be blue. The lambda is some constant between zero and half. Okay. Uh, in fact, turns out that even a very sort of even a simpler variant of the problem is also complete, which is this one. I want from each node of sufficiently high degree to have at least one red neighbor and at least one blue neighbor. So I don't want even a half and half split. Just don't give me a trivial split for this node. Just don't make any node completely unhappy. Okay, so just having one red neighbor and one blue neighbor will suffice. And notice that this is something that randomized algorithms can solve this problem in a trivial manner. Right? If you just color the vertices of the right side red or blue, for each node, well, you expect half of the vertices to be red and half of the vertices to be blue. So if you have degree at least log n, with high probability, you will have about half of them red and half of them blue. Right? And you can union bond over all the left vertices. So in the randomized model, even in zero rounds, we are able to solve this problem. I mean, the problem becomes essentially triviality in the randomized side. The interesting thing is that the problem, we don't know how to solve it in polylog n time deterministic. And if we manage to solve it in polylog n time deterministically, we would get solutions for all of these open problems. So I, I, I like to think of this as a stripping what we don't know to the bare bone. I mean, it really says that, look, this is the basic thing that you want from random bits. If you manage to solve this thing without random bits, you have actually solved the, the problem. And I should say that one can start looking at this, this problem in a few different ways. Perhaps one natural way of looking at it is that it's really asking for turning fractional values to integer values. Because if you set a value half on each of the vertices on the right, okay, and you think of each of the vertices on the left side as a, some, as some, as a pair of linear constraints, meaning that the summation on that vertex is around half of the degree, right? So these half values on the right side satisfy this thing easily. And we are just asking to turn this, these half values to zero or one without violating these linear constraints. Okay. This might start reminding many of you of the, the discrepancy theory area. There we are also essentially the same thing, right? I mean, we are, we are transforming these half and half, half blue, half red things into full blue or full red without going too far from the, from the main point. So I, I, I think this is, one can think of this as saying that rounding fractional values to integer values, while keeping some linear constraints, I and mean, perhaps just, just keeping those linear constraints up to some relaxation, up to even a polylogarithmic relaxation factor. This is really the only obstacle that we don't, we don't know how to solve in the deterministic side of the local model. If you manage to solve this one, we would have solutions for uh, all the classic problems and in fact for any S local uh, problem, any, any problem that we can solve efficiently in the S local model. Okay, so let me tell you a few words about how does this uh, sort of completeness proof go. Uh, unfortunately, the proof is not so short or brief, so I cannot really fit it in fact, on this slide. This is, in fact, where most of the paper goes. But it's a sequence of reductions from network decomposition going in a few steps, getting down to this sort of the weak splitting. Okay. So perhaps I can spend a few minutes on saying at least sort of the very high level uh, ideas behind these reductions. If this turns out to be too fast, perhaps there's no real way of sort of doing all the details and maybe looking at the paper is a better idea. Okay, so the first reduction, yes? Yes, so, so, okay, the basic question. I think you're about to show us uh, hardness, PS local hardness. Um, uh, you, yes, this is, so this is the hardness part of it. The completeness part is relatively easy. Like, or like the fact that this, this problem is in PS local, uh, that one can do it in a number of ways. For instance, well, you can also compute a network decomposition. 
and just process the the, 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 the sort of the well network decomposition is efficient to compute in this S local model, right? And then you can process the the colors of that network decomposition one by one, and in, in each of them, well, you can think about it as de-randomizing the randomized algorithm. Uh, okay. So okay, perhaps yes, perhaps I should have sort of talked a bit about that, and also maybe phrased this not exactly just about the completeness part and the hardness part. Yes, what I'm about to explain is the hardness part. The completeness part is simpler, perhaps it's not a complete triviality, but it's simpler and perhaps if we have time, I can explain about that too. Because that's roughly... Yeah, maybe there's another um, question that I just got confused. Previously you told us that um, S local is in um, local, uh, 2 to the square log n. Yes. Um, but how does this, um, how, how, how does it make sense, I mean, how can it make sense if uh, we know that in S local, the, say the last node can see the entire graph? No, it cannot. So that's a very good point. It ha all has to do with the fact that an S local, I mean, a problem is in S local if it can work for any order of the vertices, right? So I will feed to the S local algorithm an order which makes sure that there is no vertex that sees the whole graph. In fact, it makes sure that each node sees only its sort of small neighborhood. Okay. And what is that ordering? Because the decomposition, I thought, no matter how you do so that. So in, in the decomposition, the ordering would be that you process the vertices, the first color first, okay. all of them first. Then you move to the second color, you process all of them. Then you move to the third color, you process all of them. So this would be the order that is fed to the S local algorithm. But what happens in the last color? The last color touches uh, potentially everything else, no? Or... No, so, so the point is that so the, the last color still, I mean, so still it reads its own neighborhood, right? Okay, but it's also connected, it, I mean, it touches the other things, right? The other colors, the right. previous colors. But, but like, what is the chain of the colors that can sort of be? The chain can only go through the colors, right? Okay. So, and, and it cannot go down and come back and go down and come back, right? It cannot zigzag, right? Okay. In each of the colors, it can go through one of the clusters. It cannot go through two of the clusters, right? So essentially, we have just the number of colors times the diameter of each of the clusters. And those two numbers are small numbers. Okay. Right. So that's the reason that it doesn't see everything. Okay. Thanks. Good. All right, so let's let's say let's have a few words about this, this proof. Uh, okay, so there's a part which reduces this network decomposition to some other problem. The problem is called conflict-free coloring. It's actually conflict-free coloring of hypergraphs. So what it means is that if you give me a hypergraph which is k uniform, or let's say almost k uniform, where each of the hyperedges has about k vertices, maybe up to a two-factor. Okay, I want to assign colors to the nodes, I might be assigning each of the nodes many colors. It, it's not, that's okay. Uh, overall, I want to use at most polylog n colors. Okay. So I'll be assigning colors to the vertices. The, the objective is that for each of the hyper edges, you should have at least one color that appears exactly once in that hyper edge. Okay. So for each of the hyper edges E, there should be one color Q, such that there's exactly one vertex V that has color Q given to it. Okay, so this is called conflict-free coloring. So some problem that is studied. It's, it's, it's sort of a generalization of the standard colorings to hypergraphs. Okay, so there is a, there's a way of reducing network decomposition to this conflict-free coloring. Uh, just, just to give you a high-level outline of the reduction, is that we'll, we'll think about each of the balls around each vertex as one hyper edge. Okay. We won't actually take all the balls. We will take, first of all, small radius balls. These are the balls that sort of are the candidates for being clusters of the, of the network decomposition. Okay. So we'll take small radius balls and also there are some extra properties I won't go into it. So we take each of these as one hypergraph. We compute a conflict-free coloring of this hypergraph, which assigns colors to the vertices. 
And then for each vertex V, uh, it has some of its balls included in this hypergraph. Uh, we will need to find one of those balls, which has some, again, some extra properties. And in that ball, there is one unique color Q. And it appears on one vertex V. This vertex V will be the cluster center of this vertex U will be the cluster center of vertex V, and Q will be the color of that cluster. Okay, so there are extra properties. Let me perhaps not go into that property. It, it takes a bit more discussion. What do I want from the balls, and which balls do I actually consider? Okay, so that's essentially what happens in reducing entropy decomposition to conflict-free color. Uh, there's the other part of the relation which allows us to reduce conflict-free coloring to uh, this local splitting. And well, now we want to solve conflict free coloring given some Oracle algorithm for splitting. OK, so and, okay, th this will be polylog iterations of some procedure. Uh, turns out that for hyper edges that are small, the problem is easier to solve. If the hyper edge has only polylog n uh, vertices, these things we can solve with the help of this thing called defective coloring. Again, let me, let me not go into it. Okay, So there is this thing called defective coloring, which allows us to, to take care of small hyper edges in a deterministic manner. Okay, What remains after we take care of these small hyper edges is those large hyper edges, right? those that have at least log n vertices. And here is where we actually do the splitting. Well, I'll color the vertices red or blue. So think about the vertices as the the, the right side of the hypergraph and the hyper edges as the, the, the left side of the hypergraph. Okay. So you'll color the vertices red and blue. This is a more or less a fair split of each of the hyper edges. So what I will do is that for each of those hyper edges, I will just shrink it to its blue vertices. Okay. Since I had a fair split, I know that uh, I don't get an empty hyper edge. And also I get some sufficient shrinkage in the size of the hyper edge. So if I just repeat this thing polylog time, I have essentially gradually I'm pushing the high rank hyper edges into low rank hyper edges, and then low rank hyper edges, I'm taking care of them using this defective coloring. So this is more or less the outline of how the reduction goes to this uh, lambda local splitting. There's another piece to make it work for weak splitting, but maybe I, I just skip that part. Okay, so anyway, so th there was this summary, there was this aspect which was saying that rounding seems to be the, the thing that we don't understand. Okay. And for a while, I was going back and forth thinking about, I mean, did we just publish something useless, or <laughs> did we actually make a progress on something or not? I mean, I, I had struggles. Turns out that no, actually, there is something behind it. Okay. So if you look at well, at least two of the classic problems, and you start thinking about these problems as you start generating rounding problems for these two, uh, then gradually you can actually solve them. So it, it turns out that these ones would have special cases of the rounding problem, which are actually within, within reach. Okay? So I'm a bit stretching the rounding definition here, because actually those two, those two papers end up solving different rounding problems. They're not what I explained here. Okay. But I just want to say that there is there's value or there's something that comes out of this, this rounding mentality. Okay. We can actually, for instance, for maximal matching, we can think about computing a fractional matching and then we start rounding it to an integral matching. And that sort of ends up giving a more efficient algorithm for maximal matching. For edge coloring, something a bit similar. We actually there, we need to solve maximal matching for hypergraphs. And again, compute the fractional matching and then start rounding it in a deterministic manner. So that ends up giving a solution for this 2 delta minus 1 edge coloring problem, which remains for 92. And that effectively solves this open problem 4 of the, the book and open problem 5 of the book, which is about something else. And a half of some other problem. So I just want to say that this rounding mentality at the end turns out that it's perhaps useful. Okay. Let me not go further into this connection. Okay, let me say a few things about some other related work, which perhaps a bit less related, but still relevant. And let me also then conclude. So 
there are two works that are somewhat relevant to, to, the, to the talk that I have had. There is one other study of decision problems and the complexity of decision problems in the distributed world. So that's a paper by Frenio, Corman, and Pellick. Uh, one can think about what we do as sort of a generalization of their framework, but actually the problems end up being different because unfortunately in the distributed world, the usual connection that computation problems are actually iterations of decision problems, this connection is not really there. So let me not go into it. There is another work which is very interesting, and perhaps also this is one of the reasons that we started looking into this in a more complexly theoretic way, is that now there are problems for which we know that randomized algorithms are provably more efficient than deterministic algorithms. Okay. Unfortunately, it's about this, this lower range of values. Okay. It's, it's like separating between polynomials from each other or something. It's, it's saying that there are problems for which the tight randomized complexity is log log n, and the tight deterministic complexity is log n. Okay, so both upper and lower bound. So that's a combination of those papers that I've written there. Okay. But this, this, this type of uh, exponential separation, we don't have it for the classic problems where the, the randomized complexities are also log n, and we would hope to get, a, let's say, for instance, poly log n time deterministic algorithm. We don't have such separations for those problems. And in fact, many of us believe that there should be no separation. And this the surrounding starts to seem to indicate that perhaps there is no separation. Right, so this is now a summary of what is the current state of the art about the four problems. So you see in the bottom row, the, the easier problems, we now know that actually these are within poly log. So log to the three, log to the seven, and so on. But for the, the actual hard problems, we still don't know the answer. These, these remain within this two to the square root of log n. So, well, one obvious open question is, are these problems doable within polylog time in the local model, or another rephrasing of it is that, are they, with, are they within p local? Another interesting aspect would be that, okay, if we can't do the first one, can we show that these two are at least complete, or maybe one of them is complete? I mean, can we say that if we can't solve MIS, there's some good justification behind it, and sort of none of the others we can solve? Or, Something. I mean, can we can we show these basic problems to be complete instead of the instead of the local splitting or network decomposition? So that's another open problem that I would like to leave. Uh, the other open problem is this splitting rounding. I hinted that by solving effectively special cases of this splitting rounding, we managed to make progress on the bottom row of the the picture. Perhaps more special cases, uh, for instance. Uh, hypergraphs where the degree or hypergraphs where the rank is poly log n would be the place that I would say is the next target to solve. Or uh, uh, I'm calling it hypergraphs. You can also say that bipartite graphs where the degrees on the right side are all poly log n. This would be the next target to solve, uh, which would actually lead to solving a few other open problems. And this other thing I mostly glossed over it, but this S-local model actually gives a relatively convenient way of solving other problems, even in the randomized world. Like one, you, can, you can think about this S-local model somehow in an easier way, and then once you design an algorithm for this S-local model, we know how to transfer it to the randomized local model relatively efficiently. So using this connection, we got one plus epsilon approximations of covering packing LPs. For instance, minimum dominating set and so on. Uh, so I, I think this, this S local model perhaps is useful on its own as a place to design algorithms. After that, you can transfer it to the local model. All right, so that's all that I wanted to mention. Let me stop here and conclude. Thanks. Thank you, Mothan. Uh, is there any further question or? Uh, hello, can hello. you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering whether uh, is P S local same as P or P or local? Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, I have about a half of an answer for you. Uh, 
Okay, and even this half, you should take it with a grain of salt. It's not written. Okay. So, so the definition of local algorithms in this area is that uh, problems for which your success probability is one minus one over n, as in like usual notion of high probability. Okay. If I strengthen that slightly and say one minus one over quasi poly n. Okay, so one minus two to the minus log like one minus two to the minus log squared. Okay, so a slight sort of strengthening of the, the definition of what a randomized algorithm should have, which actually is satisfied for most of the problems in the sense that for most of the problems, if you run the algorithm long enough, you can also get this thing. I mean, if you run the algorithm for log n more iterations, you would get this stronger. Uh, randomized algorithm. For those things, we can uh, transform them into deterministic as local. So if your randomized algorithm is a bit stronger, if its failure probability is a bit lower than the usual notion, or if you have way of repeating it log n time and boosting the success probability, then yes, there is a way of removing the randomization and making it deterministic in the S-local model. But again, take that with a grain of salt. This is this is not written. It's more, it takes a bit of a a bit of a doing. So okay. Any more questions? Okay. If if there there is no more question, we're gonna go offline. And uh, yeah, if you want to ask more questions offline, we can stay a few more minutes after that. Okay. I'm just saying thank you again to Moten and uh, everyone's welcome to stay here and chat a bit more. And in two weeks, it's Eric Weingarten. So.